You know, God is not pleased when we suffer. There's some scriptures in Peter that almost makes it sound like that God is just really happy when we go through things, but really what he's happy with is when we behave well when we're going through things. I don't think we have any idea what a smile it puts on God's face if he can find somebody that can go through hard stuff and still be faithful to God. Faithful to God. You know, patience and faithfulness, I believe, go together. A faithful person who can find. Oh God, where have all the faithful men gone? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. <laughs> my, my. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into and share now in the joy and the blessedness which your master enjoys. God's looking for faithful people people that would be faithful to Him no matter what. Psalm 131, a Psalm of David, Lord, my heart is not haughty, neither are my eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in matters too great or things too wonderful for me. Surely, now get this, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me ceased from fretting. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, weaning is very unpleasant for the weenie. <laughs> but it can also be very unpleasant for the wiener. <laughs> Amen? And you know how we put off taking the pacifier away from the kid. Because you know what you're in for. Several nights of a screaming. Now, when mine and Dave's kids were little, we lived in three little rooms, little apartment. Our rent was $65 a month, and we had three kids, one bedroom. And so they just slept all around us, you know. Here was our bed, and here was the baby bed. And so you knew when you took the pacifier what you were in for, because it wasn't like you could close the door on their room. There wasn't any their room. There was a room. And you knew what you were in for. And I tell you, we got a lot of Christians that need to get rid of this thing. And when God pulls it, we need to stop going, ah! Come on. And furthermore, it's time for your bottles to go. This is the way we want to live. I can remember when my kids used to carry both around. Come on, have I got any testimonies out here? <laughs> but in order for your soul to be weaned, somebody's got to suffer. God's willing, he'll listen, he'll listen to you scream all day and all night. If he can get you to the point where you don't have to have this stuff to calm you down. We have to be able to stay happy and not get our way all the time. You know how nice it is when you finally get the kid off the pacifier? Now, you know how it works. The first night, it's horrible. The second night, it's bad. By the third night, it's getting a little better. Four, five, six nights, it's over. You know what? To be honest, you can break any addiction in your life if you understand this principle.
And God's just looking for people that are saying, I won't give up. I will not give up. I will not quit. Do you hear me, devil? I will not quit, and I will not give up. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Let's look at our beloved Jesus. Looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief, and he's also its finisher. Now watch this. He, for the joy of, obtain, of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross. <laughs> Everybody say, endured. endured. Remembering that that means you put up with with a good attitude. You go through with a good attitude. He endured the cross. He endured the cross. Why? For the joy of obtaining the prize that was on the other side. Do you know what? Some of you have unsaved relatives that five years from now can be serving God if you'll start consistently bearing the fruit of the Spirit around them all the time. You're not as happy about that as I'd like you to be. You say, well, what difference will that make? Because they will see that there's something changed in you. They will see that there's something now that you have that they need, and everybody wants joy. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants to be free from being tormented every time they don't get their way. Everybody wants to be free from anger. Come on, some of you need to get a little fire in your belly, and you need to say, I am not gonna live like this. I am not gonna spend 40 years making an 11-day journey. I'm not going to spend my lifetime at the same mountain going around and around and around the same thing. Getting mad every time I don't get my way. Being impatient every time I have to wait on something. Giving up on everything. Jesus said for the joy of obtaining the prize, he endured the cross. Verse 3. Hebrews 12, 3, just think of him who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself. Reckon it up and consider it in comparison with your trials so that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart and relaxing and fainting in your minds. God wants us to grow up. Amen? You know, last week a week before last, I had to speak at a, a funeral service for one of our employees, a beautiful lady named Marley who'd fought a cancer battle for eight years, and she was 58 years old when she died. And I purposely decided that tonight I was going to speak about her for a few minutes as a way of paying a tribute to her because I thought about the widow in the Bible who gave the two mites and Jesus made such a big deal out of that and you know none of us even know that woman's name but she's famous <laughs> and she's famous because she gave it her all she did her very best and God said you gave a little out of your abundance, but she gave everything she had. And you know, I can definitely say about Marley that she gave it her all to serve God the 58 years that she was alive. I don't know exactly when she received Christ, but I knew her 21 years, and she started with us as a volunteer, and for five years, she volunteered her time and got no pay in the early days of our ministry when we couldn't afford to pay very many people. And we'd send out our little mailings, and she'd come and volunteer, and she was a faithful volunteer. She wasn't one of these people who signed up and didn't show up. You know, if you're going to be a volunteer, you should treat it just like a paid job. I said, if you're going to be a volunteer, you should treat it like a paid job. You know why? Because it's a time of testing in your life. Today, we are very bad about saying we'll do things, and then we get up and don't feel like it, and we make some silly excuse and just don't go. Well, you know, I'm just a volunteer. They're not paying me anyway. Well, God will. So she was faithful, and 
They said that she never missed a time when she was supposed to be there. And even if her kids would be off school, she'd bring something for her kids to play with and set them over in the corner. She'd still man her post. And then she started with us as a call center operator just answering the phones. And we quickly realized that she had potential and she became a supervisor. And then soon after that, she became a manager. And then she became one of our top level leaders. And then she was even promoted to a top level above that and became one of the four or five people in the ministry that we depend on the absolute most. And her main skill was she was faithful. <laughs> and when we had her service, Several different people that worked with her were given an opportunity to speak for two to three minutes about her life. And without having chatted with one another, every single one of them said the same thing in a different way. She constantly displayed the fruit of the Spirit. She remembered your name. She cared about the details of your life. She was a woman of prayer. Always had a good attitude. Always had a smile on her face. I said, I, I needed to go and be part of this service. And I said, you know what? We're really not here to mourn her death. We're here to celebrate her life. You know why? Because she lived well. You know what? I'd rather live a shorter time and live well than to live a long time and live lousy. And this may sound a little strange, but she not only lived well, she died well. She died with a good attitude. She died loving God in all of that eight years of prayer and being encouraged by a little breakthrough and then being discouraged by another tumor showing up. I never heard her complain. I never heard her question God. I never heard her doubt God. I never heard her have a bad attitude. And her family said, even behind closed doors at home, it was the same way. She was faithful. And I'm telling Marley's story tonight for the world to hear as an example that God was waiting for her. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Enter into the blessedness and the joy which your master has. Do you want to have the blessedness and joy which your master has? Then be faithful. Stop quitting on things and giving up on things and having a bad attitude when you don't get your way. Bear the fruit of the Spirit. Don't just have leaves, have fruit. Amen? Fruit. Now, you know, we all want to be used by God. We want our fruit really to be a position or a place where God uses us. <laughs> Well, I want to bear, you know, am I bearing fruit here tonight? Yes, but I can tell you there's another kind of fruit that God is more interested in about my life than even what I'm doing here tonight, and it's how I act behind closed doors at home. You see, I learned a long time ago that what happens here is dependent on what happens there. If you don't learn that lesson, you just don't yet know much of anything. And you know, there's a, there's a pastor that gives Dave and I a gift every year. He has for the last several years a gift of called the Fruit of the Month Club. Does anybody know what that is? Well, that's like this really, really, really good fruit. I really like good fruit. And so, you know, so often you can't get good fruit because it's tasteless or it's dry or whatever, you know. And it can look good on the outside, but that don't mean there's anything in it. And boy, what a lesson that is. We can dress it up and take it to church, but what happens when you squeeze it? <laughs> mm. You may get squeezed in the parking lot trying to get out of here tonight. <laughs> then we'll find out if you really got fruit. You might get squeezed out at the resource table when some impatient Christian pushes in front of you. <laughs> Come on now. And I love getting that fruit, and it's so good because they let it ripen on the vine. What happens today is fruit is picked green and shipped across the country and then gassed to make it look good. 
It still may not have any taste, but it looks good. Well, I sent some people out to get me some bananas. And, you know, if I go to buy bananas, I always want one that is going to be good. You know, you, you don't want one that's rotten, but you want one that's nice and, and ripe because, you know, there's nothing worse than a, like a partially green banana. You know, it's like, first of all, it's almost impossible to even peel them. I mean, you can't even really hardly peel them. Most of the time, you've got to cut that off and then peel it. And it, I don't know what it tastes like, but it don't taste like a banana. But boy, if you get a good one, mm-mm-mm, wow. Woo! So good. Mmm, 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 mmm. Mmm. <laughs> See, that's the way I want people to act when they're around me. Mmm. Come on, when you've had lunch with me or spent a day with me, I want you to leave going, mmm. Not. That didn't have any taste at all. Can I tell you something? This is about how green a lot of Christians are when they start. You know, Moses was about that green when he jumped out and killed the Egyptian. Joseph was about that green when he told his brothers about his dream, and you're going to bow down to me. See, we always talk about how great Joseph was and what a good attitude he had, but you know what? God had him go through what he went through, including being imprisoned for something he didn't do. It took 13 years for him to ripen on the vine because he had a little attitude he had to lose. Moses had an attitude he had to lose. He didn't know how to wait on God. He felt something. Peter. <laughs> oh, man, Peter, he was always wanting to kill people. And, I mean, he rebuked Jesus, and he was always running his mouth off. And he had to meet himself. <laughs> when the rooster crowed for the third time, he met himself. I was about that green when I got started. No wonder God kept me trapped on the backside of nowhere for the first 15 years. <laughs> and I was faithful in a little home Bible study. Taught in my living room every Tuesday night, 25, 30 people. Didn't get any money for it. Believing my guts out for our socks and underwear, getting our kids clothes at garage sales. I'd quit a full-time job making good money to do this. And I did not understand why God was not blessing me. <laughs> Come on, you don't have to get paid for every move you make. Sometimes it's good to do it just unto the Lord and do it with excellence and do it with faithfulness. Amen? And then I was faithful in somebody else's ministry for five years. And that's a whole lifetime full of stories. And then God said, take your ministry, go north, south, east, and west. And for the first five years of that, I mean, I preached every kind of basement meeting, convention thing that somebody put together that you could even imagine. I mean, I'd preached to nine people off in the middle of nowhere that all looked like they were dead, and sometimes I took eight with me. Oh. Dave and I would run up down the road in a van with bald tires and didn't have the money to stay in a hotel. We'd pull over and take a nap in a McDonald's parking lot just trying to get home at night. <laughs> and then people say, I wish I had your ministry. I just want to slap them. <laughs> and I did not understand why God did not release me to the world. You know, you can know you've got a call on your life, but it's more than about a call on your life. you got to ripen on the vine. Jesus is the vine. We're the branches, and we're supposed to bear good fruit. 
but you got to hang on the vine until you're good and ripe. <laughs> Don't. You're wondering how I got a banana that green. I had my guys paint it. I told them today, I said, I bet when you took this job, you never thought that you'd scan the city for green bananas and when you couldn't find them. Because see, they came back and said, we can't find them. I said, then paint me one. I don't give up. <laughs> I wanted a green banana. I said, make me a green banana. It's amazing what you can do if you won't give up. I don't want you to forget this. Some of you have got a call on your life and you are so full in your soul of wanting to get on with it. You sit in church and you just can't resist being jealous of all the people that are singing and worship leading and you're just like, why God, why? I can sing better than all of them put together. <laughs> Come on, don't tell me you don't think that. I used to watch people preach on television and think I could preach better than that in bed. And God, why do you have me trapped in the basement of some banquet center with 50 people? <laughs> Come on, is anybody getting this tonight? Yeah. Took David 20 years to get ripe. God anointed him to be king 20 years before he got to wear the crown. 20 years of enduring the obnoxious Saul, who spent 20 years trying to kill him, throwing spears at him. You got anybody throwing spears at you? I do. The judgment, the gossip, the criticism, the opinions that people like to have about stuff they don't know anything about. <laughs> the people you try to be good to that hurt you and on and on and on and on. And in the middle of all that, God says, love your enemies. <laughs> Bless those who curse you. Be kind to and give benefit to those who abuse you and misuse you. And you're going like, oh. And that's when we want to quit and give up. But you stay on that vine because you're ripening. You're ripening. And one of these days, you're going to be picked. Come on. One of these days, you're going to be handpicked by God. You see, the day when I got ripe, God handpicked me. And he put me. And people would say, man, I see you on television everywhere now. Where did you come from? i say, well, trust me, I was somewhere, but it wasn't anywhere you would have wanted to have been. <laughs> I was getting ripe. I was getting some humility, some gentleness, because I had a hardness in my soul from being hurt and abused. I was learning how to treat people. And you know how I learned how to treat people? By not getting treated good myself. And thinking, man, I ain't never treating anybody like that. I'm not ever going to treat anybody like that. I'm not going to talk to people like that. Sometimes that's the only way you can learn what not to do. God's going to pick you. Payday's coming. Just be patient. Trust God. God, I'm just going to stay right here and get good and ripe. Mm -mm 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 -mm. We don't need any more green Christians out there wearing leaves. <laughs> we need people that are bearing ripe. Fruit. Amen. Come on, give God praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus.